it's really hard right now because I just get so scared to even open my apartment door and leave my house. I haven't been able to work and I don't know if, you know, I'm gonna be, I'm gonna be okay. Social isolation is a huge problem for many of the families that we're working with, especially families who are already struggling. We're dealing with the population that sometimes feels like there's no help available to them or that they're out there and they're by themselves. Court is basically canceled for everything but dire emergencies. There are no visits between parents and their children. If parents are expecting to have a child returned, reunified with them, it's not going to happen. It's really hard trying to speak to lawyers and caseworkers just to get a communication system open on what's going on with the case. There's also kids that they're homeless right now, you know, because they don't have that connection to their foster parents. Or they leave home because they're being abused. So the situation that's happening now is extremely important that the youth understand and they know without a doubt that CASA will always have their back and that we're always going to be there. In normal circumstances, CASA is appointed to the cases of children in foster care when judges are concerned that the child is not getting their needs met by the foster care system. We get assigned to these families to help advocate for them and protect them. And as the COVID-19 crisis started to really unfold, our team began figuring out how we were going to pivot to virtual advocacy. The epicenter is now clearly New York. And by tonight, New York State's 19 million residents will be under a stay-at-home order. Even with everything that has been going on, we're still able to get things done because the youth still need the services. They still need the help. They still need the resources. We've been helping families access emergency grants, apply for unemployment and SNAP benefits, helping kids who are in school get laptops and internet access so they can do their online schooling, and making sure that kids who've been kicked out of foster homes or college dorms have safe places to live. And then there's just staying in touch. How are you? Good in yourself. My CASA worker, she reaches out to me just to see how I'm doing, just to see how my baby's doing. That means a lot. The CASA workers, they're doing what they always do. They call us, they, they text us, they check in with us. That necessary advocacy piece has not gone away. If anything, it's just become more important because whether that's substance abuse treatment, mental health, stable housing, these systems that were already hard to access have become that much more difficult in a very short period. COVID doesn't stop any progress. It might slow it down a little bit, but it's not stopping anything. We're still picking up the phone. We're still getting on the computer. Conference calls, emails, texts, Skype, you know, smoke signals, horse and pony, pigeon, carrier pigeon, whatever I have to do to get in touch with somebody, I'm going to do. This is the job. This is the job. What CASA is about is finding creative solutions for families to have their needs met and have their kids' needs met. That support that we need because nobody's showing up like that. Nobody's there like that. I never had that type of care before having a CASA volunteer. It's like having a family for the first time, having someone that actually cares about you. I think that's what matters to us the most. Like, you guys show up and you don't have to show up. So it's just, it's, it makes you sentimental because you, you don't have people that genuinely care like that in your life every day, you know? Evening and welcome to the hashtag Casa COVID Fall Speaker Series hosted by the Casa NYC Associate Board. My name is Sadra Battersby Quintanilla and I am the Associate Board Chair. We are made up of 40 young professionals who raise awareness and funding for Casa NYC's mission. As you may know, Casa NYC is a nonprofit volunteer based organization founded 40 years ago. Our staff and volunteers advocate for the rights and needs of children and youth in foster care. We work to ensure that children and youth transition into safe and permanent homes and that older youth have the resources that they need to live independently. 
Last year, 250 volunteers and a small professional staff served nearly 1,300 children and youth in foster care. Your presence tonight means so much to the Associate Board and to CASA NYC. We sincerely hope you enjoyed tonight's program. And with that, I would like to introduce our benefit chair, Carmen Napier, who has been working tirelessly the last few months to put this series together. Thank you so much, Carmen, and thanks to all of you for your support. The Associate Board is committed to CASA NYC's mission. And to continue to support the organization, we pivoted our annual summer event to a virtual educational series. This series is composed of five sessions featuring expert speakers in timely topics impacting children in foster care. Tonight, we will discuss the NYC education system, the rights and supports for children with disabilities, and the impact of the COVID-19 pandemic on special education. Just a few housekeeping items before we begin. Your video and mic are disabled, but we encourage you to chat with us in the chat box. There will be a Q&A session, so again, we encourage you to drop those questions in that same Q&A box. Another reminder, we have a very special online auction with over 15 items. Tonight, we will be naming winners for four of these items. The bidding on these four items ends at 720, so go check it out. Winners for the remainder of the items will be named in remaining sessions of our series. The link for the auction is in the chat box. We encourage you to continue bidding throughout tonight's program while continuing to be respectful of our speaker. The site is easily accessible from your phone. Your bids directly support the mission of CASA NYC, so please, Take a look at the fantastic items that several companies have so generously donated to the hashtag CasaCovid series. Without further ado, on behalf of the Associate Board, I am delighted to begin our presentation for session two of the CasaCovid speaker series, Foster Care and Special Education, presented by Diana Biagioli. Diana is a family educator at Include NYC and a CASA NYC volunteer advocate. She has extensive experience with nonprofits in the fields of education, immigration, and the environment, both in New York City and in London. She also has personal experience with special education as one of her children has a learning disability. Please welcome Diana Biagioli. Okay, I hope you can hear me. Um, good evening, everybody. Thank you so much for coming and thank you, Casa, for everything you do, first of all, and, for and inviting me here. Thank you to the Associate Board for organizing the speaker series and for that wonderful introduction. Um, I'll be calling for slides, so next slide, please. So just an outline of what we're gonna to discuss tonight, um, a little bit about education, special education rights, and briefly about early intervention services. I'm gonna be talking a little bit more about individualized education programs, the IEPs, um, more in depth about that, and obviously the COVID-19 COVID impact. Uh, I'll also touch on paths to graduation and alternative paths because they're very relevant to our foster youth as well as barriers for um, SWDs. I, here you come with the first acronym that I'm gonna be introducing tonight. And special education, like many other fields, is full of acronyms, so bear with me tonight. That stands for Students with Disabilities. It's a mouthful, so we often say SWDs. Um, so barriers for students with disabilities and for foster students with disabilities. I will also talk a little bit about my own CASA case at the end, and uh, then we'll do a QA. and a Next slide. So CASA has provided me to set the scene a little bit here for everybody. CASA has provided me this uh, foster care education statistics and they're pretty sobering. Uh, children in foster care receive special education services at three to five times the national rate for all children. Up to 75% of children in foster care experience at least one unscheduled school change in a school year compared to 40% in the general population. 
children in foster care consistently underperform compared to their peers in the classroom and on standardized tests. 50% of youth in foster care graduate high school, um, 20, which is 20% less than the general population. And finally, 20% of college qualified foster youth attend post-secondary education, which is 40% lower than the general population. Um, and a lot of these statistics actually are very relevant to the student I'm working with right now for CASA. So I'll, this will come back when we talk about that case at the end. Next slide, please. So to have a little more fun, because we're all virtual, um, um, we decided to do a, couple, a few polling questions for you. Please don't feel like you should know this. I know most of you probably are new to special education and you probably won't know it. So use your best judgment, uh, educated guess. Let's start with our first polling question. How are students with disabilities, SWDs remember, protected by law, if at all? Is it A, there's no particular law that protects SWDs? B, SWDs are only protected by laws depending on what state they live in. There is no federal law. Or C, there's a federal law that mandates programs and services for SWDs. And Takuhi in the background is gonna give you um, a little time to fill it in. Again, no pressure, nobody's gonna know your answer. So <laughs> just uh, take your best guess. I'm getting the polling too here, Takuhi, but I'm not gonna vote. Oh, very nice. <laughs> Right, just a couple more seconds. Yeah. All right, so we've got to about 9% for A, 35% for B, and 57% for C. You guys totally got it right. Thankfully, there is a federal law uh, for uh, students uh, that protects students with disabilities. So we'll talk about this in the next slide. All right, so IDEA is the Individuals with Disabilities Education Act. It was re-signed in 1997. It is a federal law and it was originally called the Education for All Handicapped Children um, Act of 1975. Obviously, handicapped is no longer a word that we use. Um, what it did is, uh, what this law created was the IEP, the Individualized Education Program. We're gonna be talking a lot about this today. And it is a legal binding document with money attached to it. So that's very important. Two principles under IDEA that are very important, and I'll refer to them later on, are FAPE, Free Appropriate Public Education. Um, and as you will notice, all those words are pretty clear, except for appropriate. What is appropriate? And this is where people like, um, including YC and other advocates come in because a lot of parents have to struggle to fight for the appropriate programs and services for their children um, and guardians as well, obviously in the foster, in the foster youth population. Um, LRE, that's a little trickier, least restrictive environment. I will talk about it now a little bit, but wait, if, you, if it's not clear, wait till I talk about programs and it may be more clear for you. Basically, students with disabilities, according to IDEA, are supposed to be placed as much as possible in the least restrictive environment, therefore as much as possible with the general student population. All right, I'm gonna leave you with that because uh, I'm gonna talk more about that later. Next slide, please. So our next polling question, it gives, you, it gives you a chance also to not listen to me for a little bit and me to rest. Which statement is true for individualized education programs, IEPs for SWDs, remember students with disabilities? A, students may have an IEP until they graduate from high school or turn 21. B, students may have an IEP until they graduate from high school or turn 18. Or C, students retain their IEP if they attend college. And we'll give you a little time for that. Again, don't worry about this. This is not gonna be a test. Nobody knows what you're doing. It's interesting to learn it this way maybe for some of you. All 
All right. So, ooh, we have a close race here. 36% for A, 36% for B, and 28% for C. This is a trick question. The answer is A. Thankfully, students may have an IEP until they graduate from high school or turn 21. So next slide, and I'll talk more about this. The reason, um, while we're waiting, yeah, the reason is because students with disabilities oftentimes need more time. So they often need to graduate a little later. Um, the college aspect, I threw that in there because students do not carry their IEP to college. It was a good guess though for those who put that in there because they can use their IEP to get accommodations in college. They will not get their programs and services, but they will get accommodations. And I will talk about accommodations later, so bear with me. All right, so we're gonna talk a little bit about early intervention. That is the special education services that uh, students can get from birth to age three. Um, the services are provided in a natural environment, in the home usually, um, whereas the IEP um, are, is for ages 3 to 21 and the services are provided in the school. So if we can go to the next slide and we'll talk a little briefly about the early intervention. So early intervention are supports and services for children aged birth to three, like I said, with developmental delays and or disabilities. It's important to note that those are provided by the New York State Department of Health because the IEP is actually provided by the DOE, the Department of Education. They include all those services that you see listed there. Very importantly, and why I highlight it, is that studies have shown that the younger you address delays, the more likely they are to improve or even disappear. This is obviously relevant to our foster youth population who may not have um, uh, somebody uh, always taking care of them, uh, uh, taking care of their IEP, making sure that they're, uh, they're developing uh, the way they should. So it's um, something to remember for foster youth. If a child is eligible, a service coordinator will set up a meeting to develop an individualized family service plan, an IFSP, different to an IEP. Okay, could we go to the next slide? We'll talk about the IEP now, the differences. So an IEP is a legal binding written document. I already mentioned that. And it maps out a program of instructions, supports, and services. It includes, it's actually quite lengthy, a good IEP should be quite lengthy. Um, I highlighted a few of the important sections. Uh, it has to list one of the 13 federal mandated disabilities. I'm not gonna list them all, but like learning disability, speech and language, autism, emotional disability, and many more. Um, it has a section in the beginning called the PLOP. I like to call it the blob because it's usually very, very long, uh, but it should be long. It should talk about all the present levels of performance of a student, not only academically, but in the home. So this is when we tell guardians and parents, anybody that's um, advocating for the student, to please chime in, chime in, and uh, tell the school about anything that is going on at home, in the community, with friends, and so forth. Then there's the annual goals. Uh, and those are also, that's a pretty lengthy section uh, oftentimes. And those should be SMART goals, not just vague goals. So SMART, if I remember what it stands for, specific, measurable, achievable, relevant, and timely. I did. And then a very important part of the IEP are the services and programs. So if you remember when we were talking about FAPE, Free Appropriate Public Education under IDEA, this is when the school staff and the parents, the IEP team, which we'll talk about a little later, should be focusing on the most appropriate programs and services. There's also a section for accommodations and modifications. I will not talk about this right now. We have a whole slide on it, so bear with me for a bit. And remember IDEA, uh, LRE and IDEA, the least restrictive environment, the IEP must always talk about the least restrictive environment and why they're choosing one more or less restrictive environment over another. Finally, I'm adding transition in there um, because it's one of the areas I worked a lot with students in transition. Uh, let me backtrack a little bit there what that means. Transition can be any change from um, pre-K to school and so forth. But on the IEP, it refers to high school to post-secondary, meaning uh, school, further school, uh, employment or, um, or vocational training or what may be. That's one area that is often ignored and not um, discussed early enough. And that's why I'm highlighting it there as well. Uh, could we move to the next slide, please? I think it's a polling question. 
Yes, it is. How does a student obtain an IEP? Most of you, please, no pressure. And most of you will not know this unless you're involved in a special ed. Only with a referral from a member of the school personnel. B, with a referral from a member of school personnel, a doctor or a parent guardian. Or C, with a referral from the Department of Education or the Committee on Special Education. Okay, do your best. I'll take a little break. I hope you're enjoying these polling questions a little bit. I feel like we should be playing this, this um, what is it, the Jeopardy? The Jeopardy tune? Okay, here is the poll. Uh, nobody said uh, A is correct. 74% um, said B and 26% said C. And you are again correct, 74%. It is B. If we can go to the next slide. So you obviously need a referral to start the process. I mentioned that in all three uh, options. The referral should be in writing. You wanna definitely always do everything in writing because you want a record of when the process starts. Um, a referral, like uh, I said, may come from a teacher or other school personnel like a principal, a vice principal, a school psychologist, so forth. A doctor as well, uh, that usually happens when they're younger. And the parent guardian, and I highlighted that because a lot of parent guardians um, don't know about this right or are sometimes dissuaded from doing it. I had a case a couple of weeks ago, a Spanish-speaking mother. I, I, um, Spanish is my first language, by the way. Uh, I was helping a Spanish-speaking mother who was worried about her daughter, five-year-old, and they were telling her there was no issue. Uh, and I said, well, you still can ask for a referral for an evaluation. It doesn't matter what they say. So she did it and they are now gonna evaluate her. So parents and guardians have to step up oftentimes. Um, so, Children ages three to five, pre-K, they receive a preschool IEP and five to 21 year olds receive an IEP. Um, they're very similar, but they, are, they have some differences. We do workshops on both of them, uh, but they're similar. Okay, next slide, please. So what happens after the referral is the next slide. I'll wait for it so you can see it, there we go. So the steps are, and by the way, these are not sequential steps, they can take, uh, uh, any, anything can happen at any time. They don't have to go one after the other. So first of all, the school does have to send a consent form home. The parent or guardian has to sign a consent for an evaluation. This is a psychoeducational evaluation. Um, there are other evaluations. I won't go into them because it's a lengthy, it would be a lengthy discussion, but that's the main one. They also must take a social history from the parent or guardian. So social history is either over the phone or in person, obviously right now over the phone during COVID, uh, asking the parent about milestones, what's going on at home with family, with peers, so forth. A medical report just means your annual, the annual medical. And then the student is observed in a classroom. Uh, somebody, the student doesn't know they're being observed, obviously. It should be a psychologist, a trained psychologist. They're just looking to see how the student is reacting to the teacher, their peers, where they're seated, and so forth. And finally, um, we schedule an IEP meeting to decide if the student needs an IEP, and if so, what uh, services and programs are needed, okay? I wanna highlight here that this process should take no longer than 60 school days, okay? Not calendar days. So not including weekends and um, uh, holidays. So that's why you keep, I, I told you to keep the date and keep everything in writing to keep track of what's happening. Okay, next slide. It's our next polling question, I believe. May a student attend their own IEP meeting? Hmm. A, no, students do not ever attend IEP meetings. B, yes, a student may always attend their IEP meeting. Or C, yes, as long as the student is 14 years old or older. All right, I'll give you a little time here. Next time we have to have the Jeopardy theme there, Takui. <laughs> I feel like I, otherwise I need to talk more. 
for sure for Jeopardy next time. <laughs> <laughs> All right, the poll's coming in. So 9% um, for A, 39% for B, and 52% uh, for C. And this time I tricked you, and I did that on purpose, um, but you'll see later why. The answer is actually, thankfully, B. Uh, can we go to the next slide? And I'll talk a little more about it. So um, students are always um, allowed to attend an IP meeting. As a matter of fact, a lot of times parents uh, don't have childcare and they have to bring the student with them, which is not ideal, as you can imagine with some small children. Um, but they may attend anytime, but must be officially invited from age 14, which is why I put that trick question there. Sorry about that, I was being cheeky. Um, they're not forced to attend though, but we highly encourage it because students need to start uh, taking ownership and learning how to advocate for themselves. Also, frankly, when a student is in the IEP meeting and they start talking for themselves, the, the rest of the IEP team listens to them much more than to the parents or guardians. So that's something to, to take into consideration. Um, this is who attends an IEP meeting besides the student, if he or she wants. The parent or guardian, definitely. A psychologist, if an evaluation is being reviewed and discussed, because the psychologist has to translate this technical document for the rest of the team. A special education teacher, general education teacher, if one is involved. And the district representative can just be one of those. It could be the psychologist or one of the school um, teachers. Finally, um, the providers are also important when needed, not always. So if a student has a therapist or a counselor that has important information, they could either come, phone in, or write a written report. The same thing with outside experts, such as a doctor. And finally, uh, we always encourage uh, parents and guardians to bring somebody with them to the IP meeting. It's really, it can be, the first time I went, it was so lonely. It was so lonely. Um, I went by myself. Uh, so you, you wanna come with somebody in your family, a family member, a neighbor, but if you can't find somebody, um, there are parent members that are trained. A parent member is a parent or guardian who's had a student with an IEP in the last five years and they have been trained, it's just a one day training, to not to advocate and help the parent make decisions, but to help them understand and clarify what's going on in the meeting. And I don't, I didn't add it here, but very important to the parents who do not speak English well or at all, you can also have an interpreter. You must ask for an interpreter or a parent member three days or, or longer before the IEP meeting. Okay, so moving on to the next slide. We're going to talk about what kinds of meetings you can have. So the initial one is just the one off, the very first one. And then after that, every year, um, you should have an IP meeting within 365 days from the last meeting or less, right? So that's why you want to keep dates. You want to keep everything um, documented. Uh, also, every three years, they have to reevaluate re your child because um, your child changes. There's going to be developmental changes. Uh, there could be something going on at home. You also may request a, an evaluation earlier than three years if something's going on. If there's lack of progress, something unfortunately traumatic may have happened to them. Uh, so you can request reevaluations. And that would uh, cause the fourth one, which is a reopening. And that's when we open um, an IEP meeting before time, before the, the annual or the reeval. Uh, but you have to have a strong reason for this. You can't just ask for a reopening without valid reason. And you should get advice from advocates like it include NYC for this. Okay, next slide. Next polling question. Love to hear what you guys think of the polling questions. All right, when children in foster care change schools, or when any child, but we're talking about foster youth today, do their IEPs follow them? A, yes, an IEP easily transfers from one school to another. No, a new IEP must be established. Or C, yes, if the move is within the school district, but if moving to another school district or out of state, they may need a new IEP. That's a mouthful. All right, here we go. Polling has begun. You're doing really well in these. All right, so um, we have 15% saying yes, 0% saying no, 
and 85% your smart crowd saying uh, uh, C. And in fact, it is C. Uh, I do think, however, um, I have to say that I wish uh, that I think it should be A. I think an IEP is a federal mandated document and it should easily transfer. There are, dis there are differences in districts sometimes in the states. Um, they can take the IEP and start with the old IEP so the student gets services right away, but they need to start, um, um, they need to schedule a new meeting as soon as possible, a new IEP meeting. Okay, next slide. Uh, we're getting to the nitty gritty now of the IEP, the programs and services. And remember, I keep talking about LRE. This is when the IEP team needs to consider the least restrictive environment always, all right? So this is just a summary. I'm not gonna go in depth with all, all the programs and services, but the main programs um, are SETS, which is Special Education Teacher Support Services. This is not a very restrictive uh, program because the students are in with general population. They need, the IEP will state that they need SETS in um, social studies, science, math, reading, writing, whatever it may be. So a special education teacher comes in to the classroom, works with the student one-to-one, -one or with a small group, and that's called push in, or they can take them out of the classroom, which is called push out. Another uh, program that is not very restrictive is ICT, Integrated Code Teaching. Look at the alphabet soup there. Um, this is, some of you may have heard of this. Not all schools have it. Um, they have a class where uh, about one third of the students have an IEP and two thirds of the students are uh, from the general student population. And they have two teachers, one, uh, the one grade, general grade teacher and one special education teacher. On the more restrictive uh, side of the spectrum, we have the special classrooms. So some examples are like 12 to one to one. What that means, just keep in mind, the 12 is the students in the classroom, the one is the, the teacher, special education teacher, and the other one is an assistant. It can be a para, a paraprofessional that's trained to work with students with disabilities. Under services, the most common are speech therapy, occupational therapy, and physical therapy, as well as counseling, group, or individual. And oftentimes I see both, the group and individual on the IEP. And finally, assistive technology, which I think is one of the most underused services. Oh, don't get me started, that's a whole other workshop. But there's so many amazing devices that some kids um, and youth uh, could use and they're not getting it. So it's always a struggle. Uh, next slide, please. So this is a trickier slide. I mentioned it before that I was gonna clarify it. Accommodations and modifications. So uh, accommodations change how a student learns materials and takes tests. Accommodations could be listening to audio recording instead of a reading a test, working with larger tests, print size, um, hearing instructions read um, um, and questions on tests spoken aloud. And a very, very common one is testing. A lot of students uh, get time and a half or double time in a separate location. Now, modifications are very different. They change what a student is taught and tests they take. So they may complete different homework problems, answer different test questions, and uh, take alternate assessments. So when we talk in a couple of slides, when we talk about credential options instead of high school diploma options, you'll see where the, where the alternate assessments come in. Next slide, please. So now let's talk a little bit about the impact of COVID-19 on special ed. Obviously, it's become much more difficult to identify students. They're not in the school setting. Teachers don't have the same contact with them. That has been a huge issue for many parents, families, and guardians. Um, I am sure most of you have been hearing about all the mess that's going on right now with the full remote learning versus hybrid. Um, they did not get their act together. There's been a lot of hitches and obviously that interrupts education for many students. Delays in evaluation, especially at the beginning, they did get their act together more with that um, later uh, in the year. Oh, this is a tough one. Lack of technological resources and tools. So many students did not get the right tools um, and that obviously impacts them tremendously. And lack of in, uh, access to internet as well. And many parents and professionals have complained that their students and, and children are getting too much screen time, they're suffering from Zoom fatigue, and they're just not engaging because they don't wanna be in front of a screen uh, learning. 
Very importantly, the last one, and this one we have seen a lot at Include NYC, the stress on parents and guardians, especially those of younger students or with, and or with more significant disabilities. Um, oftentimes, the parents and guardians become either the support teacher or even the teacher. They have to sit there, um, and it's very grueling for them. I did want to add some positives because we, I have talked to some uh, professionals that have reported the positives. Uh, some, I, I was at a webinar a couple of weeks ago when one of the evaluators was saying how now she can evaluate so many more different people from so many more different um, boroughs and, era, and codes, area codes, because she doesn't need to travel. Uh, she can do it via uh, telehealth or via Zoom or I don't even know what, what they use right now. Um, so that's one of the positives. Uh, some students actually respond better. They are um, they like that one to one um, with the, with the teacher, and they're not stressed by having other students around them. And also, some special education teachers have said that they're not so distracted if they have to teach somebody one to one in a classroom full of other kids. Sometimes that's distracting for them. So those are some positives. Next slide, please. Oh, we got another polling question, I believe. All right, so what options do New York City students have to obtain a high school or a high school equivalency diploma? A, there are numerous ways to obtain a high school or high school equivalency diploma, as long as the student does not have an IEP. B, there's no other recourse if a student does not graduate from high school. Or C, there are numerous ways to obtain a high school or high school equivalency diploma. And I'll let you join the poll. So we got 4% for A, 0% uh, for B, and uh, very high, 96% for C. And again, you guys are right. What a great um, audience we have here. Uh, it is, in fact, C. Can we go to the next slide, please? Thankfully, there, that was the answer. And thankfully, it was an A, correct? Because that would have been very sad. Sorry, I'm just waiting for the next slide. Oh, there we go. So uh, the most typical paths um, are to get a high school diploma. In New York State, there's a Regents diploma. And you can also get an Advanced Regents diploma if you take more Regents exams. And the one I want to highlight there is the local diploma, because that's the one for students with disabilities. Um, they, there's some compensatory options in there, as well as they can also score a little bit lower on the regions in order to get the local diploma. It does not open up all the fields. If they want to go to college, they can't go to all the four-year colleges. Um, they, uh, they're sometimes better off starting at a two-year college anyway, and there are some four-year colleges that accept it. High school credentials is what I mentioned before, and um, this is for students who may not be able to take the rigorous, uh, the rigorous uh, academic work in order to get a, a diploma. The CDOS is, in a nutshell, is basically gearing a student for an entry level job, uh, getting them used to a work schedule, and oftentimes they are doing internships. The SACC is for students with more significant uh, developmental or intellectual disabilities. Um, and it's not, um, it, it, with the, again, they can't go to college or, uh, but it does give them a lot of living skills and it shows what their strengths are and what their weaknesses are. Uh, the only problem with this, by the way, that we see in my work is that parents are not always told what path their student is on. So that's heartbreaking. Um, so that's why I always highlight doing the transition planning early so they know what path their student is on. Also in this slide, we have all the high school equivalency diplomas. I won't go into all of them, but the DOE has the path uh, P2G, the path to graduation, adult learning centers for older students. Some CUNY campuses have really, really good programs. And then libraries offer courses and the Department of Youth and Community Development offers um, very good advanced and earned programs. And those are very good also for our foster youth. Next slide, please. So with a lens on our foster youth, uh, let's talk about some alternative paths to graduation, which are um, uh, more often uh, relevant to them. 
For pregnant and parenting youth, there are life programs. They're offered in uh, many campuses by the DOE, many school uh, buildings. And uh, this is for so that a youth can finish their diploma, they can finish school, and their, their little guys um, are being taken care of and have education, uh, early education. There's some credit recovery and alternative high schools uh, also in the DOE. Transfer schools are for students who did not get enough credits, they just need a few more credits. So there's schools that are used to helping the students recover the, um, the credits. Uh, for example, I had a student that I got into a transfer school last September and he graduated in March. He didn't have to wait until June because he already had all his credits by then. Uh, there's also young adult borough centers, which offer afternoon and evening programs for those students that may have other responsibilities, such as a job. Uh, and then one that's pretty new for me, I, I haven't uh, had a lot of experience with this, but Restart Academy is an alternative program that provides transitional services for students 13 to 21 who may reside in temporary or involuntary settings. All right, so next slide, please. Um, I, I'm including here, this list is by no means exhaustive, is really, uh, I, I'm highlighting five programs that I think you should know about for students and adults with disabilities. Access VR focuses on employment, period. You can apply when you are 16 uh, and you can, and even up to 55, I believe. OPWDD is much more difficult to get. This is um, the Office of People with Developmental Disabilities. You have to have a developmental disability such as um, cerebral palsy, Down syndrome, and so forth. But if you are eligible and qualified, there's a lot of services and supports. ILCs, Independent Living Centers, provide services to help adults with disabilities lead independent and meaningful lives. So they're kind of a referral center. They, they, you can call them up for housing benefits and, and referral. They often refer people to us, by the way, for education. Um, and the door, I'm highlighting the door, which is a wonderful nonprofit because they do a lot of work with foster youth. They do, they provide counseling, recreation and jobs and internships. And finally, I'm gonna chime in there with my own Include NYC. Project Possibility, which is a little part of Include, uh, works one-to-one -one with students with disabilities ages 16, 26, to help them attain their post-secondary goals. So that may be further schooling, further education, employment, vocational training, and so forth. Okay, next slide. So what are some barriers for students with disabilities? And there are more than that I, I, I wrote here, but let's discuss, these are the main ones for me. Parents and guardians are not aware or informed of their students' needs sometimes, and, and that can be really hurtful to them and their student. And, and seemingly, a lot of parents do not speak, speak English well or at all, like the mom, uh, the example I gave earlier. Um, an IEP sometimes is not a good IEP. It's not written well, and it doesn't cover all the students' needs, and we see that, unfortunately, more often than we should. Uh, services and programs recommended on the IEP are sometimes not available at school. Um, I could go on, up, but I don't have enough time, so uh, you can ask that in the Q&A if you want. Um, students oftentimes feel stigmatized and do not want to participate or be grouped. And also there's a lot of behavioral issues that may come from um, special education needs and may not be addressed. Finally, um, it sometimes happens that providers, sometimes teachers too, but it happens more often with providers, uh, leave mid-year. So that is an interruption on the services that the students desperately need. So in the next slide, please, if we could talk about, we're gonna talk about barriers for students with disabilities in foster care. So these are further barriers. So there's a lack of continuity in care sometimes, which means the IEP is not created, followed or updated. A student may have switched houses, places where they live and have to restart in a new school. And that school, like I said, may not provide all the programs and services. Also, sometimes the student lacks the connectivity, continuity. They have friends, they had a teacher they bonded with and, and that's gone because they got moved. Um, students may have more absences. That's actually very true with the case that I'm working with for CASA. And sometimes students, especially older youth, have competing needs. And again, that related to my, my CASA case, housing, employment, and so forth. And there's a, there's a uh, formal term that uh, is used in education. This is not special education. This is a term in education. Uh, a lot of students in foster, foster care may become 
SIFE, student with interrupted formal education, and there's a whole other evaluation they do for this. Um, but somebody has to tell them that that student may have interrupted formal ed education and that doesn't always happen. And finally, unfortunately, students are further stigmatized by being in foster care. So the next slide, um, I believe, is my CASA case. And I think we're doing okay with time. I just checked. All right. Well, my CASA case is this wonderful young lady whose name is not Rochelle, but we're using that name um, for her privacy. She is 18 years old. And uh, I've been working with her for just over a year. And I'm gonna, I, I, I've been doing several things with her, but I'm gonna focus on housing education and the fact that she wanted to sign herself out of the system. So I'm gonna start with the last one, signing out of the system. So Rochelle, when I first met her, was living in a group home in Queens and she did not like it there. And that's very common, by the way, but they're not happy. And she knew that when she turned 18, because she's an adult, she could sign herself out and be on her own. Fortunately, in New York State, uh, the foster care system has a lot of services and supports for student, uh, student, uh, youth in foster care until they're age 21. So my job, my supervisor at CASA, my job, my first, first job was to get her not to sign out so that she could take advantage of this um, services. She was 17 at the time and she was gonna be turning, tw um, sorry, 18 in uh, January of this year. So it was back and forth. She kept wanting to sign herself out. She just wanted out of there. But in the end, she didn't sign herself out. Um, and so far, so good. I think she now realizes that she needs the services, but it's a work in progress. Rochelle was moved around a lot. She wasn't happy in the group home. There was an issue that happened. Then she got moved to um, Brooklyn and then she became pregnant and was moved to a home, uh, um, a group home for pregnant and um, parenting youth wasn't happy about all these moves for obvious reasons. Um, adding to all the moves, um, she got pregnant and started um, uh, talking again to her biological mother. She hadn't spoken to her for years, which is great. Reunification is what we want when it works. Uh, but uh, they, they started talking about return to home, uh, which is a, a, one of the arrangements. So there you see in this slide, her goal was originally APLA, another plant permanent living arrangement, because she did not at that point uh, have a return to parent option. She was not gonna be adopted and she did not have a relative. But when she started talking to her mom, she decided that she wanted to be returned to home. But things fell apart uh, pretty badly, by the way. The mom has issues too. She's a good person, she has issues. Uh, fortunately now they're talking, they have a good relationship but she's not gonna be returned to parent. But what that did, and now I'm going to the issue of housing, what that did is that it delayed her housing. And this is where like the goalposts keep, keep changing for these, for these youth, so frustrating for them. Um, so she had not filed a housing application because she was gonna be returning to, uh, to parent. And, and then when she decided to file the application, her, um, her uh, group home and her case planner were not uh, very cooperative. I, uh, this is when CASA steps in and, and we just pushed and probed. And finally, I'm happy to report, and this is a coincidence that I'm reporting this today, uh, that she filled out her housing application this week. Um, so she's gonna be prioritized as a foster youth with a child. So we're hoping that she gets housing soon. But as you can imagine, all of these changes uh, affected her education tremendously. She was, when I first met her, she was registered in the school, but she wasn't going there. That's where the absences come in. She's definitely a SIF, student with interrupted formal education. I got, um, I finally was able to get the IEP. They had an IEP meeting, but it was to no avail because she didn't want to return to the school. Um, she felt, um, for some good reasons that she was too old. So we started exploring the high school equivalency option, which is what we're still doing now. But with all the moves she's had, um, what I didn't explain is that they're all based in the boroughs. So if she keeps moving boroughs, we have to keep changing the program. So in a nutshell, this is much more complicated than I'm gonna get into tonight. She is now, we're now trying to get um, a remote uh, high school equivalency program so that she can finish high school. So that's another work in progress. 
And um, the other thing that um, you see there is that she had an IEP, like I mentioned. Her disability on the IEP was other health impairment. And if you're wondering what that is, most people do. Uh, it, uh, it can be more than this, but it's usually referring to uh, attention deficit uh, issues. And when I first met Rochelle and I asked her what, um, why she had an IEP, if she knew, and she did confirm that she had um, attention deficit issues. Um, this is a work in progress. Uh, it's been a privilege to work with Rochelle. She's an amazing human being, an amazing self-advocate. She also has an amazing voice. And she doesn't just, she, she, it's not just that she can sing, she has a good voice. So it's been a joy working with her. Thank you so much for having me here today. And I'm gonna pass the baton now to Takuvi. Thank you. Hello, can everybody hear me? Awesome, thank you so much, Diana, for the informative presentation. I really think you nailed um, the combination between education and also casework that a lot of people don't understand when you step into the field of special education. You're literally navigating both worlds, so I think that this session is perfect. Uh, my name is Lisa Hollingsworth, and I am a member of the Associate Board I will moderate tonight's Q&A session, and I also encourage everyone to please send your questions and put them in the Q&A box for us to present to the speaker. Before we get started, I'd like to remind everyone to continue bidding on our silent auction. Your bids directly support the work of CASA. We have over 15 exciting items that have been graciously donated by companies that support the mission of CASA NYC, as well as our hashtag CASA NYC COVID speaker series. The bidding will end at 7.20 p.m. for four specific items, but which the winner will be announced later this evening. If you don't win one of these items, don't worry. There are plenty of other exciting items. We will announce the winners for the other items in upcoming sessions. So go check it out. The auction link is in the Zoom chat box. So let's dive right in. I am honored to have the chance to moderate this Q&A with Diana because both Diana and I are in the field of special education as well as working with and supporting at-risk youth. I've been in the special education field since 2002 and I've held several roles throughout my professional career. I began my career as an emotional support teacher in 2002 and held a variety of leadership positions since then. I've been a special education coordinator, an assistant principal of special education, and a director of special education as well. You should know that I am both honored and very appreciative to still support special need education students. And I also feel absolutely lucky to support the mission of CASA NYC. And on that note, I'll start us off with the first question of the night. One second. All right, so our first question is from Felicia. Can CASAs attend IEP meetings? Yes, um, I actually did not know when I first started working with CASA, frankly. Um, but uh, if they are, you, you still need the, uh, the guardian there. You still need somebody that is the parent or guardian, but uh, absolutely, if, if it's okay with the family, the guardian, you can attend the family, the IEP meetings. Awesome, thank you. Um, our next question is from um, one of our attendees. What, ch what children with disabilities do not do well with online learning? That's a great question. I would have thought it might be difficult for them to concentrate, et cetera. Yeah, no, that's a, that is a really good question. And if you recall, when I was saying the negatives, I did say that that was an issue. That was a big issue that they, um, they get distracted, they don't concentrate. Uh, anecdotally, I've just heard from several educators that were pleasantly, well, pleasantly, or they were just surprised, uh, that some of the children who get distracted when they're, especially when they're getting sets, if you remember, that's in class uh, special education, uh, they were responding better because they felt like the, they were just being, they were special. So it's not very often. I'm trying to give you some of the anecdotal positives that have come across um, my world. But it's, uh, but you're right. Most children, especially children with 
more significant disabilities um, find it very difficult. Thank you so much for that. We have another question. Uh, we have, can we please talk more about early intervention, who evaluates and what services are offered? So full disclosure here, I am not an early uh, a childhood expert. My expertise is what we call school age, that is years five to 21 and transition. So um, I, I, I do know a little bit, but I do not, for example, I don't take helpline calls on early intervention or early childhood. I direct them to my colleagues who are specialists on that. Um, if you want, um, uh, and I'm happy to do that for many of the questions I've been seeing here, I can send resources later. We have uh, online webinars on early intervention. So you see the people who are the specialists and you can get more information about early intervention. If I didn't answer your question enough, please add something else um, on the chat, uh, on the Q&A, sorry. Great, thank you for that. Next question, what about financial aid? Are there specific financial resources for children with disabilities when going to college? Yes, and not only that, for foster youth as well. Um, I'm not an expert in this. I know CASA has resources on this, so maybe somebody could, um, I don't know how you guys are sharing resources. Uh, one resource that I will share with you for anybody with disabilities, foster youth, or anybody that wants to go to college, there's a great organization called Options, um, Goddard Riverside Community Center. Uh, they're, they're based at Goddard Riverside Community Center. They do amazing one-to-one -one college counseling, and they go through the entire process one-to-one -one with the student. Um, they also do financial aid. They go through the financial aid with the student. They help them fill out the FAFSA. And in the case of uh, going to your question, they will help you with find more resources. Uh, not just um, scholarships, by the way, there's a lot of other resources, but I can't get into it right now. Great, thank you for that. Nichelle would like to know, where can I contact the door? Um, is it possible for somebody from CASA to chat it in or, or add it in? Uh, I don't know if I can do this right now. Um, the door is, you just uh, Google the door. Um, you can also call them and find out very quickly and uh, in order for students to become uh, to uh, get services from the door, they have to become members. And um, since you asked that question, I will tell you that I think the door is amazing. But unfortunately, my student from Casa had a bad experience. And when I, I found her a program there that I thought was ideal, and she refused to do it. So um, sometimes um, so I guess some students have had not so good experience. I think she had a bad experience with another student or another girl, but I'm not sure it was before I knew her. Thank you for clarifying that. Um, that's important. So we have a question from Felicia and the question states, given the overrepresentation of children of color, et cetera, in special education programs, how do you balance the potential that racial bias is pu pushing people of color, children of color out versus making sure that all kids get the care that they need. In other words, how do you balance over and under referring cases, especially for children of color? Great question. It's a great question. I won't be able to answer it here, but I will address it. This, uh, this is a huge subject. It's, uh, I mean, I'm sure, Lisa, you know about this as well. Uh, it's not just children of color, it's also children, uh, immigrant children that come from other countries that get overrepresented in special education because they don't speak English well enough, so they don't have a good enough system. Um, by the way, uh, it depends. Uh, this is when the IEP team needs to be a good IEP team, right? So the parent, if the parent gets advice from uh, one of us, from, from including NYC or somebody, uh, you can attend the meeting with more information. But Felicia, I'm so sorry that I can't give you a good answer because you're absolutely 100% right and there is absolutely overrepresentation. And there is work being done in this field. Uh, I am not particularly uh, directly involved. I'm more involved with ELS, English language learners, but you are 100% right and thank you for bringing that. I second that, Felicia. <laughs> thank you. Next question. How do you manage your role as an advocate and your career? Great question. <laughs> uh, yeah, as my husband. Um, so um, I, it's a long story. I, I've always wanted to do something like this, not necessarily, I didn't know about CASA initially. Um, I decided to, that it was very important and I work full time, but only four days a week. Uh, I somehow bargained to do that. 
Um, I also, so I have one day a week where I dedicate a lot to CASA. I also, my lunch hours, I, I call my, my CASA youth. Um, and I just use my evenings when I have to my weekends. It's very re rewarding. Uh, I learn a lot from the work and from the student I'm working with. And that's basically how I do it. I'm not sure, it's such a good question. I'm not sure if I could do it if I was working five days a week and they want me to work five days a week, but I'm not gonna do it for now. So that's how I do it. Very honest, thank you. Robin, would, no, I'm sorry. David would like to know, are there any college specific scholarships for youth who have a disability that you can share or direct us to? Yeah. Um, if you recall when I was talking about um, the, the previous question, uh, asking for scholarships, same thing. There are a lot of scholarships for youth with disabilities um, and for foster youth. Again, um, I would have to refer you to, um, to CASA for, uh, for some scholarships. Uh, Project Possibility at Include NYC also works. I, I mentioned that they work with students one-to-one. -one. And they can also uh, help identify uh, scholarships. But the real experts, the ones that do this for a living day to day, are options at Goddard Riverside Community Center. Um, they, that's what they do. They just help students uh, figure out how to attend college. And again, it's not just scholarships. There's a lot of programs um, you may not have heard of, College Discovery, HEOP, and so forth, that will help uh, students with disabilities. Thank you so much. The, the questions are amazing. So thank you all for um, typing them in the Q&A. The next question we have is from Robin. How often do foster care parents really advocate adequately for foster kids? And if they don't, do social workers have the bandwidth to do that? Great question. Frankly, I don't know if I'm equipped to answer that question. Uh, I am a special education expert. Not, um, I'm learning a lot about foster youth. I, I don't know how often do foster parents advocate. Um, and I do believe social workers have the bandwidth to do that because there's a lot of, uh, a lot of schools in New York City, is the transfer schools that I mentioned before, have uh, social workers working there and they definitely advocate for the students. I don't know if somebody from CASA wants to chime in here and give more information about that. I don't mind chiming in, uh, Deanna, for sure. It's Takuhi. A lot of it does definitely depend on um, how involved the foster parent is in the child's life. Um, you never want to demonize one party or another. Um, it just depends on who you are assigned to or who you have a, um, you know, who, who the, the child is, is living with at the, at the time. Um, but you, whenever, particularly in CASA's case, when we are assigned for educational needs, um, there's some sort of a gap or deficiency um, that needs to be addressed. And so CASA steps in when other parties are unable to, to help facilitate and move those processes along. Okay, thank, thank, thank you. you. Thank you, Takui. Yep, thanks, Takui. Um, Susan would like to know, um, well, she's asking for you to please explain the difference between access VR and include. Yeah, I rushed a little bit through that slide. I'm sorry. I just wanted to leave enough time for Q&A. Um, Access VR is a state-funded program. They are only focused on employment, period. If a student is going, um, applies for Access VR, most students with disability do get it. It's not difficult to get if you have a disability. Um, and they want to go, for example, to college. Uh, they need, and, and if, they, if you tell an Access VR counselor that you, wanna, that you don't know what you want to do and you want to be a liberal arts major, they're not going to help you um, because they want to have a goal. Um, Access VR is very goal-oriented. And um, they just want to employ, the stu um, not students, but students and adults with, dis with disabilities. Include NYC, we work with and for students with disabilities, their parents, guardians, their families. And we have a helpline um, that is free. Uh, and you can make an appointment to speak to one of us, one-to-one uh, -one on the phone. Uh, we also do workshops, which are now webinars on all areas of special education. And I think you were referring to Project Possibility at Include NYC. And that's a small project where we work one-to-one. -one. And the difference between Project Possibility and Access VR is that we're working with them towards their post-secondary goal, whether that's school, further schooling, college, for example, uh, vocational training, employment or community engagement. So we don't necessarily push them to employment right away. Um, it's more, 
I would say some a little more intimate uh, with the project possibility. I have had project possibility cases and it's wonderful. It's very rewarding, almost as rewarding as CASA. Thank you. Tara would like to know, um, so I'll say the statement. One of the challenges mentioned earlier is when and if a parent slash guardian isn't aware of the disabled child's needs, why would that happen? Good question. Is that a result of lack of communication between the school slash parent guardian? Yes, 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 to your questions. Um, basically, um, uh, a lot of parents and guardians are just not equipped. I'm a case in point. I'll use myself as an example. Um, my children were all born abroad. Uh, I am from Spain. And when I moved here, I, I mentioned my son uh, has a disability. I had no idea what an IEP was. I was lost. And, uh, but the school we were at, they had a good IEP team. They immediately noticed it. They asked me um, if they could evaluate him and, they tar and that's how he ended up having an IEP. And he had to move schools because they didn't have the right program there. However, not all schools are alike. As we know, New York City is a very unfair environment. So frankly, most of the time at Include NYC, we're helping uh, those families that are from more uh, schools that are not, don't have as many resources. Um, that's why we're there. Include NYC was created 35, 36 years ago now, I think, uh, by three moms um, in New York City who had no resources. They weren't being helped at school and they created, it was called Resources for Children at the time um, with special needs, Resources for Children with Special Needs, sorry. Uh, so yes, this is a huge issue and that's why we at Include are there. I hope that answered your question. Thank you. Um, the next question, I want to re be respectful of your name, so I'm going to pronounce it the best way that I can. Um, it looks like it is Odile Boucles Bursch. The question states, what kind of help slash support can the students with disabilities get in college apart from extra time? First generally usually have extra support. First generation, sorry, usually have extra support. Yeah, um, by the way, the support the students can get in college depends very much on the college. A lot of colleges have an uh, office of disabilities. Something that I always recommend to parents and guardians is to go visit the office of disability. It doesn't matter if that college seems good for your student if the office of disability is not gonna help him or her, right? So some offices help much more than others. Uh, BMCC, for example, has a lot of, they give you a one-to-one -one counselor, they have a LEADS program. I won't get into all the programs, but they have a lot of support. Um, so that's one thing. Apart from extra time in a separate classroom, there's a lot of supports. I, I won't remember them all. You can also get a scribe if you need note-taking. Uh, you can get uh, somebody to read you the questions, even if that is what you need. Uh, there's a lot of supports and services um, for students with disabilities. But again, it depends on the college. And some college office, uh, offices are much more willing to give you that help than others. Um, assistive technology, for example, is available in some colleges. Thank you. Nichelle would like to know, how do you differ early intervention from special education? It says early education, but I think she meant early, or she, yeah, she meant early intervention. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, very good question. Uh, I did talk about it, but I, I'm not a lot, so I can see your confusion. Early intervention is not academic, usually. Uh, they may be working with them on some reading and writing, uh, if it's appropriate at that age. It's a lot of family support. Uh, some, they, 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 it is academic, I mean, they do reading and writing, but they do a lot of family support with counseling, whatever the family may need is much more about the family. Special education is all about education in school. Special education are services that are given at the school, not in the home. Yep, that's a great clarifying point. Next question states, Will we have hybrid teachers in the hybrid school setting? Example, English and math teachers together in the same classroom for algebra, perhaps? Okay, um, I think you mean the ICT. Is that what you mean by hybrid? Um, do you want to chat it in or something? I, I don't know what you mean by... Um, ICT was, if you remember, was the class where it was one third students with disabilities and two thirds from the general population. Is that, could you clarify that somewhere? Maybe in the chat. Um, 
I'm trying to figure out uh, together in the same classroom for algebra. So basically it depends on if, if, it, if it is that, if it is the ICT class, um, it depends on what age they are. If they're in, um, um, uh, sorry, elementary school, they will have one teacher that teaches many subjects like other students. And then they'll have uh, another teacher that's a special education teacher. When they are in high school, uh, it becomes a little different. Um, it, uh, obviously the students are being divided into, into different classes. So what happens, it's a little complicated, but uh, some students in the general population one year will be, freshman year will be with the ICT class. So they'll be going around with that group of students. Um, they'll be in the same classes uh, with the two teachers. And then another year they may not be within the ICT class. Again, I'm not sure if I answered your question because I wasn't familiar, I, I wasn't really sure what you meant by hybrid teachers. Let me know if you need clarification. Thank you. Next question, what does your advocacy look like during COVID? Oh, I love that anonymous. Yeah, that's great, yeah. <laughs> ever, ever changing. It, um, the amount of changes, not just with the IEP and the regular special education, but with OPWDD that I mentioned earlier, um, it's ever changing. They keep, they keep changing the goalposts. So it's very chaotic. We're constantly sending emails to each other, updating. Um, Frankly, I'm not always sure I'm updated on that day. I have to like go through all my emails and it's ever changing. Um, so very chaotic sometimes. Thank you. Um, so we have a clarifier to the previous question. Hybrid meaning online combined with remote. Hybrid meaning online combined with remote. Um, and I have to go back to the question because she was talking about I'll go back. I'll state it again. Oh, I see. Yeah, yeah. I see the question. Um, Do you want me to state it again for the audience? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Go ahead. Sure. Um, will we have hybrid teachers in the hybrid school setting, for example, English and math teachers together in the same classroom for algebra, perhaps? And the clarifier states hybrid meaning online combined with remote. Okay. So um, the answer is. That a lot of leeway on how they're doing this principles they have to they had to hand in a plan so i can't answer the question for you particularly because it depends on your school your principal uh, my connection is saying unstable so if anything happens i am so sorry um it disappeared so hopefully everything's okay um so um it also like i said before it depends on what grade they're in they're more likely to have different teachers if they're older right um uh, again, I am really sorry if I'm not answering. I'm happy to give you my contact uh, and we can discuss this further, um, but that's all I know for now regarding hybrid. Great, thank you so much. So I see that we're coming up to the end of the Q&A, so I have three more questions that I'll pose. Mm -hmm. Okay, so the next question is, and this is from Julian. Please explain the process for parents to attain an independent evaluation. If the parent requests the, re the evaluation at school, who pays for it? <laughs> okay, my short answer, and I'll give you a little longer one, is call include NYC, 212-677-4660 in English, 68 in Spanish, <laughs> okay? Um, this is a, an involved question. I, 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 there's no way without knowing the, the, the child that we're talking about that I can give you good advice regarding this. Um, to get an independent evaluation, you need to have a good reason. They are very, they, when it's needed, you should go for, you should ask for it. But again, it's really, I don't wanna answer a question when I don't know the case and I might give you bad information. It's, it, it can be done um, and we can help you with that. Thank you so much. Jasmine would like you to explain the difference between an FBA and a BIP. Oh, yeah. All right. So an FBA, remember when we were talking about um, evaluations and I said there's a lot of different evaluations and the psychoeducational was the one that I, I mentioned. FBA is a functional behavioral assessment. When a student is having behavioral problems, um, parents should ask for a behavioral assessment, a functional behavioral assessment. Uh, and the BIP is the behavioral, um, the, the plan. That, that, so the FBA is the, is the evaluation 
and the BAP is the actual plan that is a result of the evaluation. All right, does that answer the question? Yes. Okay, next question is from Jennifer. Is it possible for a student to have a 504 plan and an IEP? No. Um, I'm, I'm kind of glad, I was hoping somebody would bring up 504 plan. Uh, Takuhi and I, before the presentation, we almost mentioned the 504 plan. Very quickly, what a 504 plan is, it, it comes from uh, the 1973, I believe, Rehabilitation Act, uh, Section 504, that gave rights uh, that, that if schools received funds from, uh, from the government, they had to uh, give services to students with disabilities. But 504 plan comes with no money. So what a student can get with a 504 plan is accommodations and, and uh, some help. Some, some schools are very generous and they add other things in the 504 plan, but it's really a, a contract between the student and the family. And it's not a written a binding uh, legal document like the IEP. I hope Thanks. I answered that. Yes, and here's our last question, it's from Julian. What is the difference between a special education advocate and a special education attorney? Can a parent or guardian have both? If so, who pays for it? Oh, wow. Well, okay, first of all, I'm a special education um, advocate. I'm not an attorney. Uh, I am trained to help guide parents, guardians, families, uh, professionals to make, uh, to get better services and programs for uh, students with disabilities. Attorneys are the, um, there's a lot of really good special education attorneys, by the way. Uh, and the big, the big one that you may have heard of is Advocates for Children. They have um, special education attorneys there. They are actually, if there's any, um, uh, if an impartial hearing is called because the parent and the, I, and the IEP team are not coming, they, they don't agree, and the parent wants to do an impartial hearing, they have to go to an attorney. We cannot help them because we don't have that training. I hope that answers that question. Yes, it does. So this part concludes the evening's Q&A session. A special thanks to Diana for joining us today. Thank you so much. It's been a pleasure hearing from you. If we didn't get to your question live, Diana or a member of CASA staff will answer your question in the Q&A box. Thank you all for participating and spending your night with us. I'd like to pass it to Takui Mosoyan, CASA NYC employee for some additional words. Thank you so much, Lisa and Diana. Thank you for that wonderful uh, presentation. What an engaging Q&A session we had today. Yeah. I just wanted to say um, that, you know, as you heard from Deanna, uh, our speaker, that children in foster care are um, more likely to require special education. And while there are resources definitely available, the COVID crisis does place children at risk of not having their educational needs met. Um, CASA NYC's cost-effective model of advocacy helps to ensure that children have the undivided attention and support of a CASA volunteer like Deanna during these uncertain times. A donation of just $100 helps a preschooler um, suspected of developmental delays uh, to receive an evaluation and participate in early education, uh, early intervention services. You know, every donation, no matter the amount, um, adds up and helps us reach more children. If you so feel inclined to make a gift, um, there's a link in the chat box. Um, thank you so much in advance for your support. Before we wrap up, um, we'd like to announce tonight's silent auction winners. So I'll pass it back to Carmen, our benefit chair. Hi everyone, how are you? Good to see you all again. Thank you Takui and thank you again to our wonderful presenter, Diana. As we've mentioned, another way to support CASA NYC is through participating in our onli online auction. With that said, Let's announce some auction winners, shall we? Uh, I wanna give a quick shout out to K Carol Accessories, A Design Jewelry, Chess NYC, and Plantogram for their donations in support of our cause. Now, let's announce some winners. The winner of our first item, gonna look here for the winner. Drum roll, please. <gasps> Tiffany L. 
Oh, thank you. Tiffany L. This is the accessory fashion package, which includes a handbag, wallet, and passport cover from K. Carol and a design. Congratulations, Tiffany. All right, the winner of our next item, which is one month of language lessons virtually from Fluent City. And the winner is Sean C. Congratulations, Sean C. I am jealous. All right, our third item for tonight which is a gift card to order a tree of your choice, such as a mango or an avocado tree from Plantogram. Oh, I did the wrong one. Well, I'll do chess. <laughs> All right. So you know what the fourth item is. <laughs> Virtual events, y'all. All right. One week of chess camp from Chess NYC. How cool is that? The winner is... I'm waiting with bated breath. Tell me, tell me, tell me, tell me who the winner is. Hetty M, what a cool name, Hetty. I'm jealous, I wanna play chess. That should have been on my uh, quarantine goal list. All right, now as I already said, the winner of our final item, which is a gift tree to order a mango tree or any other fruit tree, an avocado tree. I don't know if I said that, but that's really cool. Get your, get your protein on. All right, the winner is, look at that tree. I want that. It would die though, I wouldn't water it. <laughs> <laughs> All right, who's the lucky winner? L Baker. Congratulations, L Baker, and congratulations to all our winners. You will receive an email after tonight's program on how to claim your items, so don't worry. And a thank you to each and every one of you who placed bids. A reminder that we still have several other items that are available on the auction site. So uh, keep bidding, keep that bidding going, and we'll keep that open for those items throughout the rest of our series. So if you didn't win tonight or you haven't gotten around to bidding, we encourage you to take a look when you get a chance and consider bidding on one of those creative packages available. And of course, tell your friends, please. Every bid supports CASA and the mission of CASA. Now, I'm gonna pitch it back to Sadra for some final words. Before we conclude tonight's program, we want to extend a very special thank you to Diana, our guest speaker, for sharing her perspective and wealth of experience with us this evening. And to all of our guests, we hope to see you again on October 14th when our guest speaker, Dr. Ovito Williams of Columbia University, speaks with us about structural racism in the child welfare system. This will be a very interesting and very interactive discussion, and we hope that you will be a part of it. We will leave a link to the registration page as well as other information on the screen shortly. Thank you so much for joining us, and thank you for your continued support. We hope you have a wonderful evening. <laughs>